One of Sky's great gifts was that he nurtured people, nurtured their dreams, nurtured their vision, and he did that throughout his life here in Hawaii in every arena of his life. Loretta Ables Sayer is a Tony-winning Broadway performer, and she knows the power of Patrick Dixon holding her vision for her, of his inspiration of holding her dreams with her. Uh, okay, how do you follow that? Jeez, you don't have any like kids or animals to come up here next? No, send the Filipino chick singer, she'll do something. Uh, That was absolutely chicken skin. I mean, I think the hair grew on my legs over that one. Yeah, my lip too. Okay, so um, I'm sitting here looking at my little list and I'm so nervous. I've never seen so many wonderful extemporaneous speakers in one place since I, the last time I was at Unity. Um, I have to... I have to say thank you so much, Margie, for allowing me the 45 minutes to speak also. <laughs> you know, how do you put an almost 50-year friendship uh, into five minutes? It's almost impossible to do, because just talking about those eyes, jeez, that's an hour in themselves. So let me tell you about these eyes. Um, I was raised Catholic. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned again. <laughs> and is Reverend Hirano, please forgive me for what I am about to say. <laughs> please, okay. I just needed to make that clear because I was scared to death that proper Christians were going to hear me speak. I know you unity people are crazy. <laughs> but in talking about my friend Patrick, he was the most irreverent reverend that there ever was. Anyway, so I was raised Catholic, and I uh, had been going to church at St. Philomena's in Salt Lake um, for a few years, and at about the age of six or seven years old, I remember, you know, we'd have to rush to go to the church, and right before we went in, you'd have to stop and pin a doily on your head, <laughs> because you could not go into the church without a doily. And one day, I tried to do it. I tried. And my sister and my mother said, what? You put that on your head. And I got so angry. And I said, why my brothers don't have to do it? Ray doesn't have to. Why do I have to put this doily? And my sister said, you can't go into the house of God without wearing that. I don't even know. What is it called? The Amantia. That's it. Are there other Catholics in the house? <laughs> Peace be with you. So anyway, at seven years old, I revolted, and I decided that I was going to follow my uh, spiritual path elsewhere, and I heard that there was a, a Sunday school in Salt Lake that a bus would come and pick us up right down the street from where I lived, so uh, I decided to go there all by myself. I can't believe my mom let me do it, and so there I stood on a street corner. <laughs> early beginnings <laughs> and this bus pulls up and the door swings open and this man with the most sparkly blue eyes was driving the bus and he said hiya are you going to first baptist tabernacle yes it was baptist and i said yes and he said come on in sit right here in the seat behind me. And there was a seat open, so I sat behind him. And he closed the door in this big red bus and it was filled with kids. And he said, okay, it's time to sing. Let's do the Bible booster song. <laughs> now, I didn't, you sang at church? Um, I was used to going to Catholic churches where you just had to sit there for an hour and not do anything. And if you tried to say a word, your mother would pitch your inner thigh. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we're supposed to sing now. And he goes into this, we are the boosters, the mighty Bible boosters. Come on, everyone. Everywhere we go, people want to know 
who we are. So we do. Oh, there's Baptists in the house. I love it. Okay. So I thought this was the coolest thing. We're on this bus, and this man is making us sing. His name, by the way, was Patrick. And I ended up learning all the childhood songs, church songs, uh, I learned from Patrick. Some of them I learned and stumbled upon um, until I got the lyrics like, Yes, Jesus Loves Me. And uh, let's see, what else is there? Um, Jesus Loves the Little Children. I love that song, except when it got to the color part, I could never get the colors right. So it was red and green and yellow, bright, yellow, purple, red. And what I did know was they never said brown, and I had issues with that, too. <laughs> so I loved going to that church. Not being there at the church, going to the church on the bus because of Patrick. I couldn't wait to just sing and sing and sing. Why did we have to get out? Then we went to the Sunday school class. And he would assist. Well, I had no idea he was actually studying to become a Baptist minister. And I believe, correct me, hello, you gorgeous Dixon men. Are they go gorgeous runs in this family, by the way? I'm trying to remember now, was Patrick living in a trailer behind that church, do you remember? It seems to me he, there was a trailer back there he was living in. So anyway, I went to this church and I was going to the Sunday school classes and uh, we got a new Sunday school teacher and all of a sudden we went from getting ribbons for memorizing scripture to being taught these lessons and it was lessons about things that I didn't understand. My seven-year-old mind didn't understand when she was telling us, Jesus died for your sins. What did I do? I was seven years old. And I kept thinking, I killed Jesus. And I carried this horrible, horrible burden about it and realized that oh, maybe it's time to go on and continue my search for a church. And uh, the great thing about the minister there, that when you would go and actually watch the sermon, he would talk very quietly, and he would try to get his point across. And he would whisper his lines. And just before you nodded off, <laughs> hell and damnation would happen. <laughs> and you'd shake. And I would see Patrick listening. You could see all the theatrical things in his head was going, oh, yeah. Okay, this works. Keep this in there. Anyway, I stopped going to that church, and I lost track of, of my dear bus driver friend, Patrick. Until years later, uh, I showed up at Radford High School, my first day of school, my freshman year, and I was walking up the hall, and this skinny, skinny, lanky guy with big black-rimmed glasses and puffy brown hair and a puka shell necklace <laughs> was walking towards me, and he had those eyes. And you couldn't forget those eyes. And he made eye contact with me, and, and I was thrilled to find out he was my drama teacher. So from knowing him from when I was seven, learning all of those songs, the Christian songs from when you were a child, I learned from Patrick. Then I went to Radford, and, and for four years, he was our teacher. And um, he was more than a teacher, though. He was our friend. He was barely 10 years older than most of us. And um, he had us calling him Patrick. Mr. Dixon in front of other uh, teachers and the principal. But within the confines of his portable classroom, it was Patrick. And he taught us things back then all about life, much like he did there at Unity, that there are no walls. There are just doors that need to be opened. He looked for opportunity everywhere. And he was a drama teacher in a portable classroom that had no stage. So he built a stage with black curtains and a sound room, and he got a spotlight. And it was a safe haven for so many of us that felt like geeks, and we were all geeks at 13, 14, 15, 56, I'm still a geek. 
but anyone was welcome in this room. And it was the very first time that uh, anyone really opened my eyes to musical theater, to theater, in fact. We would, he had a record player, and we would listen to music from Oklahoma and uh, Gypsy and all of these wonderful shows. I mean, really, this was like way before Glee, for those of you that are too young. <laughs> Um, and we put on these shows. So it was the first time that I was exposed to Lil Abner and Kiss Me Kate and Once Upon a Mattress. And we performed these shows, and he taught us everything that he knew about drama, uh, all the basics. And he would tell us all the time that he would quote his teacher. He would tell us about this brilliant teacher that he had. And he would say, Vanita Ray Smith taught me everything I know. And Vanita Ray Smith would say, and so Vanita Ray Smith, as far as we were concerned, was a goddess somewhere. And by the way, she's here with us tonight. Vanita, where are you? Please stand up so we can see you. There she is. He would talk about her all the time, and she taught him, and he taught us. And, and I can say everything that I knew, that I learned about drama, I learned from Patrick, from the cafeteria in the class when we would do our productions. He would stand at the back of the cafeteria, and he would say to us, sing to me, sing to the back of the cafeteria, speak to the back of the cafeteria, enunciate, enunciate. If I can't hear you, they can't hear you. He would say, if you don't believe the story you're telling, then they're not going to believe the story you're telling. He cracked all of these things into our brain, things that stick in my brain. Okay, more chocolate stuck than anything else, but still, these things stick in my head. But he taught us all these things. My friend Linda Jones, a fellow Patrick student, said that he taught her uh, how to sing with a vibrato. Who knew what a vibrato was? And he would teach you how to sing with a short vibrato, <laughs> kind of like Stevie Nicks. <laughs> anyway, so he taught us, he taught us so many things um, about drama and about life and about taking chances. And, and at a very young age, I knew I wanted to go into theater and I knew I wanted to be a singer. Uh, but I had a mother that, wanting to, I guess, protect me from going into such a tenuous kind of career, basically told me that I couldn't do it. And don't even think about doing it because nobody ever succeeds in this. And I talked to him about, about that. And Patrick said to me, you know, Less than 1% of the people that go into show business can make a living out of it. Less than that are the amount of people that become a success. And my world crashed, and I thought, oh my God, this is all I ever wanted to do. And he said, and you should keep doing this because you're going to make it. And he would tell me this. For every time that I heard that I couldn't do it, he would tell me two times, five times that I would. And for years, through high school, he carried that torch and he made, that he made sure that he taught me everything that he knew and encouraged me to sing. He also inspired other kids at Radford to do so many other things, to explore the world and to not be afraid, to open doors and take chances. And he would do things, besides being a drama teacher, he took students to Kalopapa, Molokai, so that they could meet people that were, I don't know if this is a politically correct term, leper colonies, can we still call them leper colonies? That's what they were called then. And he would, he would introduce them to the patients with Hansen's disease and have them meet them and, and learn about their culture and learn about what they had done. He would take students to the Big Island and uh, one of our fellow students who was a Channel 2 reporter, Jim McCoy, said that he remembered Sky took a bunch of students to the Big Island. And in one day, they went surfing, they went up to Mauna Kea and skied down the slopes of Mauna Kea on trash can lids and jackets, <laughs> and then they hiked and saw the volcano. All these things. And so he inspired travel in everyone. And then he took a group of kids in the summer of 73 to Europe. Somehow their parents said yes. <laughs> Can you believe that? They have lawsuits against things like that now. And 
And he took them for three months. They went over there. They did not stay in a hotel one night because he sewed together two huge tents that they slept in. He didn't have a way for them to be transported around, so he bought a VW bus and packed all the kids in. And for an entire summer, they did some things. I have to write, look at some of these. Okay, they ran with the bulls in Pamplona. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> they snuck into the Colosseum at night. They witnessed the beauty of the Swiss Alps. They visited the Dachau concentration camps. They went to theater in the West End in London. They drank beer in the beer halls in Munich. <laughs> it was all about life. That's what he was trying to teach us. Joy de vivre. Ocole Moluna, kind of the same thing. Uh, they camped on the banks of Loch Ness in Scotland and they visited Pompeii, Venice, and Paris. He opened the, our minds and our hearts and our brains to experiences that we never, ever, ever would have experienced in any other way. He inspired us and he believed in us and he taught us all about taking chances and following our dreams. Um, right before I graduated, he decided to embark on another career. He started singing at Benihana's, as you heard, with Kaipo Hale. And um, so we were still in high school. We would hang out in the classroom with him during the day and then go hang out in a bar with him at night. <laughs> and we'd bring our parents with us. See, he had this way of making everybody feel like they were safe. I learned what a Tom Collins was when I, I I'm sure I was 27 by then, I'm sure of it. Um, anyways, so he did Benihana's for such a long time, and, and you will hear from many people that there was a special connection that he made. He brought people of different walks of life and races and brought them all together and made us feel like family, and we still feel like family. We don't see each other all the time, but there is a certain bond. He taught us. This tall, skinny, howly boy taught us about aloha. And we still share that. Well, in the middle of working at Benihana's, he started another career. And he became the musical director for Keola and Kapono Beamer, who were a huge um, act here. They had a great hit song that they had just released called Honolulu City Lights and he became their musical director and as he was rehearsing he found out they needed a reservationist. So he called me up and he said they need somebody to take reservations and see people you really need to get this job. So I went down and I got the job through him. Well, to make a really long story short, the Beamers performed five nights a week. They had this up-and-coming comedian, Andy Bumatai, that was opening for them. And back in the day, on Fridays and Saturdays, Andy Bumatai used to have a show at one o'clock in the morning. Does anybody here know what one o'clock in the morning is? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work on my, on my clock. So Andy had the show at one o'clock in the morning, and Patrick played for that. Where he got his energy from, I have no idea. But he's playing for the show, and unbeknownst to me, he would tell them how Loretta, the girl up in front, can sing. So one night, I think probably sick of hearing this, Andy asked me to come up on stage, and Patrick was playing the piano for his show. And we picked one of our huge two-song repertoire um, <laughs> to perform. And... Luckily for me, Keola and Capono had stayed that night after their show, and uh, the next day, Keola Beamer called me and said they're putting together a new show. Would I be their featured female vocalist? <laughs> so Patrick was directly um, responsible for um, my embarking into a musical career. Um, I should say the one job that he probably never got was as a choreographer, because the man can't dance. Um, he had like two steps that he could do, and you've probably seen them both. The first one is this one. Okay. 
Now, if he was really digging into the song, the toe would point. His third step would be a march, if you consider that a dance step, and four steps if you consider marching in a circle. Um, that's probably the only talent he didn't have, and, uh, but he still made the best that he possibly could from it. Anyway, so we went on with our professional careers, and then I think it was about 1985, I got a phone call to sing a Sunday at Unity Church. That's a cult, right? Uh, <laughs> Now, I had no idea what to expect when I showed up that Sunday, and, but I thought it was the most fantastic thing I'd ever been to in my life, because for the first time I'd been to a church service where I was being celebrated for being me and for being a perfect child of God. Apparently, I didn't kill Jesus. <laughs> And I had never heard so much laughter and so much joy in one church. I'm almost finished, I swear to God I am. <laughs> never heard so much laughter and so much joy and had such a nasty, rotten group of friends that, that I met there. Um, I remember, I have to just tell you this one time, the first Sunday that I was sitting with everyone in the pews after I had sung, and they announced in the, the uh, what's it called, the songbook? The, what's it? The hymnal. That's right. They have them in the Baptist churches. Um, they said, turn to page 129. Thad tells me the name of the song was The Magic Penny. I was sitting between Thad Hegerberg and, and Patrick, who was still Patrick at the time. And the first line of the song is, guess what I've got in my pocket? <laughs> guess what I've got in my pocket? I could, from tears started streaming down my face, and the pew started to bounce. And the pew bounced the whole time. What are you guys laughing about? It was it's a religious song. <laughs> anyway, again, so irreverent and so much fun I, that I used to say that unity, the only thing missing from unity is happy hour. So we loved going there, and no one knew that he could sing. And I would ask him why he didn't tell them that he could sing, this incredible talent. And he would say to me, he'd pat my knee, and he'd say, Honey, my time will come. <laughs> Patience, what the heck is that? So eventually they did find out that he could sing, and we were doing a concert, and he did a very religious song that particular night, sat at the piano, and sang a little ditty called the day the squirrel went berserk <laughs> in the Baptist County Church, and it's all about a squirrel running up the minister's leg. <laughs> you get the gist of it. It was a fantastic sermon. Something shifted that day, and there was a light that he had on that stage, and it was the same light that he showed to us when we were in his school. It was the sparkling eyes, it was a sense of humor, it was all of the information about drama that Vanita had taught him, that he had instilled in us. And he was able to find a connection between the drama and God and teach us. He was uh, probably one of the strongest speakers that I've ever heard and told some of the greatest lessons, and really the lessons, best lessons in my life I learned of him. The other stories are so filthy I couldn't tell you. <laughs> we'll have hot chocolate, we'll lay on the floor, and we'll voila out for hours. But um, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to have my uh, first performance on a Broadway stage. And it was really important for me to have two people there, my husband and Skye. And on my opening night, he was there. And before I walked out on that stage, I stood on the side and I remembered everything he said to me. Talk to the back of the room, enunciate, remember your words. If you forget your words, 
Just make the next line rhyme. Oh. <laughs> I've used that one so much. Anyway, we used to joke and laugh that when he was 90 years old, he'd be sitting in a rocking chair saying, I think I want to be a fireman. <laughs> well, we didn't get a chance to see him be that fireman, but I'm sure he's somewhere around us in the sky, telling stories, making people sing and enunciate, and uh, putting out fires everywhere else. Before I leave, I need to just say to you something that my dear friend Angela Porba taught me as an affirmation for someone that has made an impact on your life. Whatever name you knew him by, I knew Patrick Dixon. And I have to celebrate Patrick Dixon because that's who existed when I was seven and 13 and 18 and 23 and 40. Patrick Dixon was in my life. But because I knew Pat, I know more about God. So in whatever name that you know him, can you please affirm that with me? Because I knew Pat, I know more about God. God bless you all. Loretta, there's just a small penalty for going over your time. <laughs> Get out your calendar, you're coming back to sing at Unity, girlfriend.